Before we leave the topic of type inference and polymorphism, there is one more complication we need to discuss. It has to do, unsurprisingly, with mutability. Mutability always makes your life worse. What do all of these expressions have in common? Well, they're all refs, and they're all refs to something of a polymorphic type. Right? What type is none? It's an alpha option. What type is the empty list? It's an alpha list. What type is the identity function? It's alpha arrow alpha. But something unexpected happens when we put each of these into UTOP. So what is ref none? It's not alpha option ref. It's tick underscore week one option ref. Isn't that weird? What's a ref to the empty list? Tick underscore week two list ref. What's a ref to the identity function on x arrow x? Oh my. So what all these have in common is weak type variables. You saw the word weak showing up inside of each of those type variables. So what I want to do next is to explain to you what weak type variables are. But you're going to need to understand first the problem that they solve. So let's turn to that. Here's the problem. Suppose you have this code in which you bind the identity function to the name id, and then you create a reference to that identity function, update the reference, and then try to use the reference. Let's focus in on the second line. What should the type of the reference R be there? Well, you might initially think it should be an alpha arrow alpha ref, because it's a reference to a polymorphic function that takes in an alpha and returns an alpha. OK, we know now from type inference that we would generalize that to a type scheme. So R would get generalized to alpha dot alpha arrow alpha ref. Now that it's been generalized, each time it's used, it gets instantiated. So here, when we update R to be the successor function, that's actually a function built into OCaml. It's just the function that adds one to an integer. Well, then we'll instantiate the type of R from that type scheme to a type int arrow int ref, because we're going to discover that it needs to be an integer function. At the point at which R is dereferenced and applied to true here, during type inference, we'll again instantiate that type scheme, but this time we'll instantiate it and figure out that it needs to be a bool arrow bool ref because it's being applied to a bool. Oh, something bad just happened though. If the successor function is stored in R and we dereference R and get that successor function out, it's a function that expects an int as input, but we just applied it to true, which is a bool. So the world's going to blow up here. We just did something that's not type safe. OCaml is never supposed to allow us to do this. And indeed, OCaml doesn't allow this code. Let's try this out in UTOP. So we have the identity function, which we can then store in a ref and update to be the successor function. Now, if I try to dereference that ref and apply it to a Boolean, I get an error. This expression has type bool, but an expression was expected of type int. So OCaml doesn't allow this code to run. And in fact, there is a type error that occurs. The solution that OCaml is using here to prevent that kind of explosion from applying successor to a Boolean is something called the value restriction. The value restriction is something that shows up in many languages, and it says that a mutable polymorphic value can never hold more than one type. You can only stick an int into it, or a bool into it, or an int arrow int function, or whatever it might be. OCaml currently implements the value restriction with weak type variables, which are what we've seen showing up a couple times now already. A weak type variable stands for a single unknown type, which is exactly what our type variables did before we introduced generalization for polymorphism. Eventually, a weak type variable is instantiated with the actual type, and from then on is not a type variable anymore because it's been instantiated once and for all. Going back to our code here, 
let's look in more detail at something that happened with the types. So when I bound R as a ref to id, it got a type involving a weak type variable. That's what any type variable showing up here with underscore weak means. So here we got the type uh, tick underscore weak to arrow tick underscore weak to ref. So this is a ref to something that is a function. And that function is going to take the same input and produce the same output type. But that function is not polymorphic. It's just there's an unknown type here that hasn't been solved for yet, essentially. OCaml doesn't know whether I'm going to stick an int arrow int function in there or a bool arrow bool or something else. But then later on, I do put such a function in. So I can take the successor function, which is an int arrow int, and I can store it in that reference. It gives me back unit. But look at what happens now to the type of R. It's no longer involving weak type variables. That weak type variable has been permanently instantiated at int. And from now on, we're never allowed to stick a different type of function in there. So we couldn't stick a bool arrow bool function in there, for example. That doesn't work because not has type bool arrow bool, not int arrow int. So it kind of looks like the type of R is changing when we do that mutation. And there is a small sense in which it is. It's that there was an unknown type before when we hadn't yet instantiated that weak type variable. But when we do the mutation to store successor inside of R, then that weak type variable gets instantiated. It's finally known, and that's what we used from now on. So that's the value restriction. It's possible you've even seen it crop up in your own code before. Now that we've studied type inference, you can appreciate why it's there. As I said before, OCaml currently implements the value restriction with weak type variables, but other languages have played with different ways of enforcing it. And languages continue to play around with relaxations of it, because it turns out there's sometimes you can get away without requiring it completely. It's not just an OCaml thing, though, by the way. And it's not even just a functional programming thing. Even Java has to deal with the value restriction. Suppose we open JShell and create a class to represent animals. And then two other types of animals, elephants and rabbits. Now let me create an array of rabbits. So I have an array here. Its type was declared to be animal array. But I'm allowed to store a rabbit array in there because rabbit is a subclass of animal. That's subtype polymorphism at work in Java. What if I tried to put an elephant in this array? Should that code work? Well, the first element of that array is, according to the type of the array, an animal. I just happened to stick a rabbit in there before. So could I stick an elephant in there now? No. That compiles. There's no type error there. Instead, it gets past the type checker and to the runtime where I get an array store exception. What's that about? An array store exception is raised when you try to store something of the wrong type in an array. Now, in this case, the array is an array of rabbits. That's what it was created as, and so it can only ever hold objects that are of class rabbit. Now, maybe you could have a subclass of rabbit. That would be fine. But you can't stick something that's not a rabbit in that array, even if you have a reference to that array as an animal array. So Java disallows this because, hey, maybe someday you're like writing a loop over that array and it's assuming every element of the array is going to be a rabbit. That would be violated if you allowed it to be an elephant. You wouldn't want an elephant to sit on a rabbit. Poor little bun bun. So Java prevents this with an array store exception. It's really just the value restriction in another guise. We have a mutable polymorphic value. In this case, the mutability comes from the array, and the polymorphism comes from subtype polymorphism, where a class extends another class. But it is the value restriction again, because you're not allowed to change the type of that mutable polymorphic value. 
once it's become a rabbit array, it can only ever be a rabbit array. You can't stick an elephant. So I hope that learning about type inference and polymorphism and mutability has helped you understand not just OCaml better, but Java and maybe many other languages better as well.